disaster. 3.30 in the afternoon when most people's bodies are acclimated to going for a run, taking in that, vegging out, whatever, after six hours of listening to talk. And this is the most philosophical of the six talks. <laughs> so, total calamity. Disaster. Okay, I've, lo I've lowered your expectations, right? <laughs> anyway, the topics that I've chosen were pretty much suggested by um, Abe. Where's, where's Abe? He's hiding. Okay. So once again, interrupt uh, with you don't understand what I just said or seems highly dubious or... <laughs> whatever. <clears throat> so we've discussed the role of justice in Christian scripture, that in the first talk, and in the second talk, the relation in scripture between justice and love. And I mentioned that the biblical writers don't tell us what justice is. They don't give us an account, a theory of justice. They assume that we know well enough what it is, for their purposes, and their purposes are to urge us to imitate God in loving and pursuing justice. From what they say about justice, it's very clear what they think should be the priorities that we set for ourselves in the pursuit of justice. But to say it once again, they don't give us a theory, an account, of, and so forth. <laughs> but that's what I'm going to do today, give you my own in condensed form, hope it's not too condensed theory or account or way of thinking about justice. How should we think about justice? I've come to think that there are two fundamentally different ways of thinking about justice in the West. And I'd be interested to know whether um, in the East this, or in the other parts of the world this is also true. Well, in the West, um, that is the, the North Atlantic. <laughs> the northern part of the West. <laughs> it seems to me that you'll find these two ways of thinking about justice operative in philosophers and others who theorize about justice. But I've come to conclude that you'll also find these two ways of thinking about justice and how lay people think and talk about justice. So let me do my best to describe these two ways of thinking about justice. I call one of them the right order conception of justice, right order. And I call the other the inherent rights, inherent rights conception of justice. Let me explain starting with the first, the right order way of thinking about justice. The right order theorists, theorist holds, as the word suggests, that a society is just insofar as it's rightly ordered. Yeah, and what is it to be rightly ordered? And he holds, secondly, that a society is rightly ordered insofar as it conforms to some sort of objective standard. There's some sort of objective standard. A society is rightly ordered when it conforms to that objective standard, and that's what it is for a society to be just. As you would expect, there are different views about what that objective standard is. Catholic theorists, theorists in the Catholic tradition, will almost invariably say that it is natural law. Natural law is that objective standard. A few of you have read the contemporary US philosopher John Rawls. John Rawls holds that this objective standard is principles of distribution 
that members of society have agreed on. Those of you who remember Plato from your college days will recall that the objective standard is what Plato calls the just itself, or justice itself, an, an idea with a capital I, or a form as it's sometimes translated. And the theologian Joan Lockwood O'Donovan, who with her husband has been teaching at the University of Edinburgh, Joan calls it the objective standard, the, ob I'm quoting her, the objective matrix of obligations. Matrix is a pretty sophisticated word, the objective complex of obligations. So different views as to what that objective standard is, but the, what they all share is that a society is rightly ordered insofar as it conforms to whatever that objective standard is, and society is just insofar as it's rightly ordered. For getting hold of the basic idea, I think it's easy, I think it's best to take Joan O'Donovan's way of thinking. An object, objective matrix of obligations, a complex of objective obligations. Now, the idea is that these obligations are purely general in form. They deal solely in generalities. What that objective complex tells us is that it tells us how X-type people in X-type situations, you see I'm using a purely just an X, how X-type people in X-type situations are obligated to treat Y-type people in Y-type situations. Pure, pure generality. It says that people of this sort in this sort of situation, I mean, for example, it says that people of this sort in this sort of situation are obligated to help people of that sort in that sort of situation cross the street, to take a simple example. But that doesn't so far forth tell anybody that they're obligated to help anybody cross the street. It all hits the road when it turns out that I'm an X-type person and you're a Y-type person. And then what it says is I'm obligated to help you, Pat, cross the street. So you get the picture, it's objective, totally general obligations and they only touch down when a person fits, when one person fits the type and another person fits that type and then they're ob obligated to do what that general obligation specifies. Some people, or quite a few people, call that second type of obligation, the one that actually attaches to me, a subjective obligation. The objective ones are those purely general ones, but then if I fit the type and you fit the type, then an obligation attaches to me and I'm a subject and so they call it a subjective obligation. And what about rights on this way of thinking? Well, some order, some right order theorists reject all talk about rights. Just get rid of it. I mentioned in my first talk that a fair number of North American evangelicals are hostile to the idea of justice. Let me assure you that there are even a lot more people who are hostile to the idea of rights. They want nothing to do with it. So some of the right order people will say, forget about rights. And in fact, you could read Plato's Republic, which is very much a right order view. And Plato doesn't talk about anybody's rights. He just, he just doesn't. doesn't there's no Greek word there that's rightly translated as rights, correctly translated as rights. Other people are willing to talk about rights that are conferred on us by legislation. My right to a social security check, monthly social security check by virtue of the US social security legislation and by virtue of my fitting, fulfilling the requisites. <laughs> 
But John O'Donovan is willing to go to my ear rather reluctantly a bit farther and admit that there are natural rights. But she thinks of them as just corresponding to those subjective obligations derived from. If I've got this objective obligation to help Pat across the street, then she correlatively has a right with respect to me to my helping her across the street. So the rights are derivative from the obligation. So you get the picture. I, I mean, it's got a kind of elegance, right? There's an objective matrix of obligations, purely general, specifies generalities. But some people will fit the types, and then they have obligations, and then corresponding to the obligation, correlative will be a right. Yeah? Can you give a more real example of crossing the street? Like, what would be an example these guys would use for X, 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 Y, Y, and, and how would it look subjectively? And then how would Well, crossing the street is a real example, but it seems a little bit trivial. Um, that's when they use one of their books. The, the objective matrix will say that people of a certain type are obligated to come to the aid, to, to the financial assistance or whatever, to, maybe to the security, to the security, to, a, to the defense, security defense of somebody else. X type people are obligated to come to the defense of this type of person. Now, I happen to be an X type person, you happen to be a Y type person, so in fact, I, in fact, I have this obligation toward you to protect you against this threat to your life and limbs. And then Joan Lockwood would say, correlatively, you've got the right, derivatively, you've got the right to my doing that. So who would be the X type person that they would use as an example in a Y sort of person that would have the right to who would what? So, like, are, are they saying like a rich person has the responsibility to protect maybe everybody else has to protect Or is this like an able-bodied person when they see somebody on the side of the road have the obligation? So here's what uh, the great court preacher of Constantinople and Antioch in fact believed. He believed, maybe I have it in one of the next lectures, I quote the passage. John Chrysostomos believed that it was the obligation of wealthy people to give their extra shoes to the poor people who have no shoes and to give their extra food to the poor people who um, are lacking in food. Now, so far forth, that's purely general, right? Now, let's suppose that Micah is one of these rich people and Malchus is one of these poor people. So, Micah fits the first type. He's one of the rich guys. Mike, uh, Malchus fits the next type. He's one of the poor guys. So now, in fact, we get an actual obligation. Micah is obligated to help Malchus. Micah is obligated to give his extra shoes to Malchus, who's got no shoes. And then, on Joan O'Donovan's view, um, derivatively from that obligation is the right. Malchus then has a right to being given Micah's extra shoes. Does that do it? John O'Donovan or Donovan? O'Donovan. John Lockwood, or maybe name is Lockwood O'Donovan. O apostrophe. Donovan. <coughs> Make sense so far? Yeah. Well, the, the Kuyperian idea of uh, just adjudication for the differential. Sorry? Spheres. You know, Kuyper had the idea of just adjudication for the differential the spheres of society. It's a mouthful. Um, so that also an objective standard kind of idea? Yep. Yeah. So as I say, it's a little bit more complicated thinking through it all in terms of Plato's forms, natural law. I, th I think the, but, but I mean, those are alternative ways of thinking about this objective standard which specifies general obligations somehow or other. And then you look to see who fits the generalities. And one, if somebody fits the generalities, well, then they've got an actual obligation, actual subjective obligation. And then Joan O'Donovan thinks that there's a correlative right. Yeah. Um, Jim? Uh, 
Where do they anchor the objective nature? Ah, where do they anchor the... Um, John O'Donovan thinks that that objective matrix of obligations consists of God's laws. Plato thinks the forms are just there. Rawls thinks that the principles of distribution are agreed on by the members of society. So, natural law for the Thomist is built into how God created things. So, different views as to... Uh, so, what about the scriptural views that would... That would like Omar, who would say God's revelation, you know, speaks to the disorder of the world and gives a moral vision of reordering that kind of the neo orthodox view of this. Would he, he be a right order person or an inherent rights person in that? Let me ask I uh, was Karl Barth a right order person or an inherent rights person? I don't know Bart on this topic well enough to be able to say. Uh, because he talked about disorder a lot. Yeah. And right order. So you might. I don't know. Worth finding out. That was the right order conception. Makes sense? Some sense. You said if the uh, one put anchors in God's law, another in agreement in home society, I think you mentioned one other. So again, you ran through the four. forms are just. They just exist eternally. Everybody knows that that's sort of the idea. Philosophers. They don't play those rules. The philosophers are known. And in answer to Jim's question, what grounds of Plato's answer is they look, they, they exist eternally. Time is They ground everything else. There's nothing that grounds them. They're just there. Part of eternal reality. Now the, um, that was the right order conception. Now for the inherent rights conception. The inherent rights conception says that there's something about human beings. Contrast this with objective standard. The inherent rights conception says that there's something about human beings that gives them rights. And that justice is grounded on rights. Something about human beings. There does not, in addition, have to be something bestowing something on them. Something about Marco that just gives him rights. And justice, it says, is present in society insofar as people, people's rights are honored. It's perfectly obvious that the big question for this way of thinking is sort of the counterpart to Jim's question about the other one. What is it about human beings? I can say something about Mar Marco gives him rights, but what is it about him that gives him rights? That's obviously going to be the big question on this way of thinking. <laughs> So let me do my best to help you see the contrast. So this is a sort of summary. Here's the essence of the contrast. The right order theorist has his eye on some objective standard, however he thinks of it. Then he thinks a rightly ordered society is one that conforms to that standard. And that's a just society. The inherent rights theorist has his eye on persons rather than some objective standard. On persons. And it says that persons are such that they come with rights, that rights are inherent to something about them. It's not bestowed on them. My way of thinking is the second inherent rights conception. And when I've asked my, now I've got theoretical reasons for that, but when I've asked myself why that has seemed intuitively correct to me, 
my answer is, I think it's this. It was that conference in Pontchartrain, South Africa, that I told you about that awakened me. And what awakened me was those people. Those people were being abused. It wasn't that I suddenly had some insight into some objective, eternal standard. It was these people that were in front of me. I think it was that that made the inherent rights conception seem more plausible to me. Okay, now if we had all the time in the world and if you were all philosophers, I would go beyond this and offer arguments against the right order conception, but we don't have all the time in the world and you are not all philosophers, so I'm not going to do that. I'm simply going to present my own view, the inherent rights view. Yeah. Can you clarify for me the difference between the idea of inherent rights and that Catholic theory of natural law, for instance, sanctity of life? Yeah. How do we differentiate between those two? So the Catholic theory of natural law says that there is a subjective standard. Right. Natural law, law of natural law. Society is a rightly ordered society conforms to that objective standard. I mean, it starts with that standard. That right. like, and it says that's a just society. Okay? okay? The inherent rights conception does not start with some, it starts with you. So it's, it's more of a bottom up. Like the bottom up. Top down versus bottom up. So, is there an inherent autonomy? I don't know if, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know if is there an inherent autonomy in the inherent rights that we do not find in the natural law? There is an inherent autonomy of this sort. <laughs> the inherent rights conception says that if you are of a certain sort, and we've got to talk about what that is, yeah. you've got certain rights. The right order view says, that's never enough. That's never enough. Being of a certain sort or whatever is never enough to have rights. There's got to be some objective standard bestowing it on you. Think, think of it in terms of legislation. No matter what type you are, what type of human being you are, we don't just have a right to a social, a US social, monthly social security payment. The fact that I'm 65 or older, doesn't by itself give me a right. There's got to be that legislation. If there weren't the legislation bestowing it on me, I wouldn't have it. Now, the right order of theorists thinks, sort of generalizes from that picture. So instead of legislation, let's talk about natural law, which naturally confers these rights. So still trying to locate some of this. When our, the Americans here, nation's founders said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Da, 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 da. Yes. It did not. It did not appeal to any objective standard. Right. It was. It was inherent rights. Yes. Yes. Okay. This is just not because of men, but it's these human beings. Okay. So we'll have this. In, yes. The U.S. The founding of the U.S. presupposed an inherent rights conception. So that would be a John Locke. What's that? Would that be a John Locke perspective? Yes. Okay. What about John Stuart Mill? John Stuart Mill? Mill didn't like rights. I didn't think so. Okay, that's he didn't like the idea of rights. Utilitarians in general don't like the idea of rights. Marxists don't like the right. idea of rights. <laughs> so what's a right? If you're willing to think along these lines, uh, justice is grounded in rights that attach to human beings by virtue of something about them. What's a right? There's a famous formula that's handed down from an ancient Roman jurist whose name was Ulpian, U-L-P-I-A-M, Ulpian. UL, a Roman jurist of about 200 AD. 200 AD. We know about it because the Byzantine Emperor Justinian in the 500s collected all, co codified all the laws of the empire, and he leads off, his codex leads off with this formula from opium, so that's how it gets handed down in the Western tradition. Here's Ulpian's formula. Oh, I'm going to use the Latin word use 
at a certain point, J-U-S. I'm first going to just use it and then explain it. Here's Olkin's formula. Justice is rendering to each person his or her use. Justice is rendering to each person his or her use. Our word justice comes from the Latin use. So here are two ways of translating that. Justice consists of rendering to each person his or her right. Or you could also translate it, his or her due. His or her right, his or her due. The Latin use can be translated either way. Notice that Ulpian is distinguishing between possessing a right and being rendered the right. You can have a right that people don't render to you, in, in his word. Don't honor, don't grant. And if you have a right that's not honored, rendered, granted, you're wronged. Correct? So the fact that you're abused doesn't get rid of your right not to be abused. It just means that you have the right not to be abused, but it's, you're not being rendered. It's being violated. It's not being honored. You're being wronged. Okay. So first, a small parenthetical comment almost. I only make it because I got into a curious dispute with a ethicist at Oxford. He thought of rights as little metaphysical invisible things that a right was just some sort of curious, invisible, metaphysical object. And then he objected to it because these little objects on this view stand between us. Now, rights are not little, little invisible, mysterious objects. You always have a right to something. You don't just have a curious little thing called a right. A right is always to something or other. And in fact, you could, it'd be better if English skips the article there, A, and we just said right to. So there wouldn't be this temptation to think that there are these little mysterious, metaphysically mysterious entities called rights. It's just having right to, it's bearing a relationship to something. Okay. So now we've got to talk about what that relationship is like of having right to something or other. First step is maybe this. It's a normative relationship. Not a, how do you want to put it? It's not just a factual relationship, but it's a normative relationship. Here's another way of paraphrasing it. To have a right to something or other is to have a legitimate claim to it. And legitimate makes clear the normative quality of it. Okay. So next question is, and what are what sorts of things can we have rights to? If, if they're always to something, which I think they are, they're not just curious little invisible blobs, what is it that we have rights to? Let me answer that question in two parts. First, you only, we only have a right to something good in our lives. You don't have a right to a broken leg, unless the broken leg is on the way to something, something else. But otherwise, you don't have a right to a broken leg. You've only got a right to good things in your life, correct? You don't have a right to be socked in the face by somebody. Makes no sense. Rights are always to a good in your life. So, yeah. In some countries, people have the right to drown themselves. And we what? could argue that that's not good for them. To do what? To use drugs. 
to use narcotics. In some countries, oh, people oh, have a right. Oh, all, to... all the way through here, what I should have been said is I'm talking about moral rights and not legal rights. Oh, okay. And, and, and I'm talking about primary justice and not retributive justice. I should have made that clear. Legal rights split apart from moral rights. You can have a legal right to do something that's morally wrong. Lots of moral rights, thank goodness, are not inscribed in law, or the law would be too flat and thick. <laughs> and it's never to be enforced. Somebody else said it, of course. Yeah. Um, Joel. Does it have to be a right to the presence of something positive? Oh, no. It could be a right to, to the something absence of something. Oh yeah, it can be a right to the good of it can be a right to the good of not being insulted. Okay. And it can be a right to a future good. Right. Sure. So it can be a right to a, a not something. So here's the second part of my proposed answer to what sorts of things we can have a right to. I think rights are always to ways of being treated. To the good of being treated a certain way. A right is always to the good of being treated a certain way. Normally to the good of being treated a certain way by one's fellows. But Nina's question raises a sort of qualification here. Also, the right to being treated a certain way by yourself. You can wrong yourself, as when you quite intentionally become a, an addict. But let's, let's set that one off to the side. So, okay, that's, I think that's really important. Rights, a right is always to the good of being treated a certain way. Being treated a certain way. And the being treated may be not, not being insulted or being aided, uh, whatever. So I said that rights are normative relationships. Now what we can add is rights are, in my view, normative social relationships. It takes two, at least two, to have a right, except for that case about yourself. It takes two to be treated a certain way. So I think rights have, put it like this, I think rights have sociality built into them. So in my view, a society is just insofar as people are treated as they have a right to be treated. Insofar as they are treated as they have a right to be treated. Okay, so that tells us what kinds of things we can have rights to. The good of being treated a certain way. And that leaves the big question. And what is it to have a right to be treated a certain way? Yeah, that's what rights are always, what they always grab onto. But what is it to have a right to be treated a certain way? And I think that's probably the biggest challenge that faces anybody who wants to develop a theory of rights. And here's why it's a challenge. There are lots of really good ways of being treated by your fellows that you don't have a right to. It'd be really nice, but you don't have a right to it. I think one of Rembrandt's greatest paintings was what he called The Jewish Bride. And it's hanging in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. I think it would be a terrific good in my life if the Rijksmuseum donated the Jewish bride to me along so to hang on my living room wall, along with a substantial security force, of course, to keep stand guard otherwise. So I think that'd be really good. Enhance my life enormously. Enhance Claire's too. Other people. Invite people to come over, so forth. But I don't have a right to it. I'm not being wronged by the Reichsmuseum by virtue of their not having 
and given this painting to me, right? And you can multiply all kinds of nice ways of, ways of being treated that would be really nice. You might regret not. You know, I don't spend much time thinking about it, but if I did think about it, I might regret that the Rijksmuseum has never made, taken any steps whatsoever to donate any of its holdings whatsoever to me. Um, I don't know, at most regret. But I'm not wrong. So here, you see the obvious challenge. How do you differentiate those good ways of being treated that would be really nice, but we don't have a right to them, from those ways of being treated that we do have a right to? You with me? The dominant answer in the literature, let me describe it ever so briefly, the dominant answer in the literature is that rights secure autonomy. And by autonomy it's meant you yourself deciding how you're going to live. That rights are safeguards for autonomy. That's, I would say, easily the dominant view in the literature. It's, it's got to be refined, but here's the picture. We've got a right to determine our own mode of life. And so the, the rest of the bundle of rights are just more, are just what guarantees, secures, protects that great central right of the right to determine your own mode of life. Okay, now in spite of its great popularity, I don't think that answer will do. Here's one reason. It's perfectly obvious that everybody doesn't have a right to do whatever he or she wishes. And so you've got to explain, <laughs> you've got to carve out the relevant idea of autonomy. And I think no, no philosopher has ever succeeded in figuring out what are, what, what are actually the, the limits on that supposed right to determine your own mode of life. Yeah. Can you just explain a little bit more what that, the right to secure autonomy, like maybe a couple of examples of <coughs> oh. people who use that, how, what it looks like? So the idea is that in oppressive regimes, it's the regime that's telling you how you have to live. The idea is that a this is, in a way, a theory. This also becomes a theory of liberal democracy. In a liberal democracy, the idea is that each citizen will choose for himself or herself how they're going to live. The, the, the state isn't going to tell you that. So China says one child, one child policy. That would not be. That would. That would be a violation of autonomy. Each person should be allowed to determine determine how many children they want. Autonomy, determining your own mode of life. Now, as I say, one problem is you've got to qualify that in some way because obviously it's just not true in general that people people have a right to do whatever they feel like doing. Uh, yeah, Robert? So, uh, social autonomy, right? Because Kant talks about a different type of autonomy and heteronomy in one's own decision-making process. Um, but this, what you say, is in terms of the relationships between people and the state and not so much as your own decision-making and deciding your own good and your own life. Yeah, uh, Robert is remarking that Kant distinguished between what he called heteronomy and autonomy. Heteronomy, and Kant's example of that is that is God telling us what to do. And this view is, is opposed to that. Actually, this view basically comes out of Kant. I mean, it's, 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 it's basically a Kantian view. Autonomy. Yeah. Um, uh, in, in the United States, I mean, I'm not, I don't know that well, but I'm saying that uh, there's an individual that wants to die, and the, uh -oh. the doctor system dies. Is that On this view, that person should have the right to, right to if, if they want to choose to die, they should have, have the right to choose to die. Exactly. That would be an example of what I'm talking about.
<laughs> now, as I say, everybody has to qualify that a little bit somehow, but, but the basic idea is the right to choose your own way of life or, <laughs> or ending life. Yeah, good point. Yeah, now I need a... Do I have a track? <laughs> On this view, on this view, he started out by saying everybody has the right to shape their own form of life. And then once you've said that, then you say, that can't I have to qualify that not absolute. I don't have the right to. Suppose it's part of my plan of life. I get up to the side and decide to shoot something. So it doesn't have So, so they've got to specify it. And here's, and here's my point. I don't know any possible who's ever succeeded in getting a general discussion of the limits. But they have to obviously either have to be But I don't, now I think that's a serious problem with this rights or protectors or guarantees of this fundamental right to autonomy. But I think that there are, in a way, more, more important reasons. Seems to me that when we seems to me that when we think about rights, it's just implausible to think that all of them are guarantees of autonomy and that the violation of rights is always a violation of autonomy. We talked this morning about rape. It seems to me absolutely grotesque to say that what's wrong about rape is that it's a violation of the woman's autonomy. That's just grotesque. Yes, it is. But it just seems to me grotesque to say that that's basically what's wrong with it. That she's not free to live her life as she sees fit? Really? Or suppose I spy on you secretly. Just because, read your diaries, set up TV cameras in your bedroom, whatever, just for the fun of enjoying it at home. I don't do anything with it, just other than enjoy it. Your life goes on as before. I don't violate, interfere with your, your autonomy in the least. But I think I've still wronged you, haven't I? I think I've violated your right to privacy. Or a third case, I think Alzheimer's patients have rights, but they don't have any autonomy left at all. They can't shape their lives anymore. They just can't. But that doesn't mean that we can just shoot them and toss their bodies into dumpsters. So I simply don't think that the autonomy view works out, that their fundamental rights that we recognize both in law and morality, that just aren't accounted for. I don't know, do you share with me the, the idea that to, to say that what's wrong about rape is that it violates the victim's autonomy? As I say, I just find this, yeah, creepy. Yes, it does, but that's not fundamentally what's wrong with it. European courts, I'm told, do not allow prisoners to be shackled in court, you know, to have their most European courts. Now, why not? Well, I don't think it's because their autonomy is infringed on, because they don't have, there, there are these cops standing around. They, I mean, the shackles don't add anything. I think what the problem with it is that this is a way of demeaning prisoners. It's just demeaning. So, that indicates this. I think that rights have to do with the worth, the dignity of human beings. Not autonomy, but worth. To rape somebody is to treat her as dirt. It's just an instrument for your own pleasure. Nothing more. Here's the idea. We all have worth. We human beings all have worth on account of something about us. Something intrinsic to how we're created, some accomplishment, whatever. 
about every human being, there's something that's admirable, something that's estimable, something that you say, no, that's, that's good. That's really good. That's worth admiring. That for one thing. And then the other idea is that there are ways of treating people that don't befit that worth, that would only fit somebody of lesser worth. Or maybe not even somebody, maybe, maybe only an animal. But anyway, do not befit. So these two are out of phase. So I think, what, I think to wrong somebody, to violate their rights, is to treat them in a way that does not befit their worth. It's to demean them, to treat them as having less worth. So one, well, one more time, I don't know if it's the last time, Pachestrom. Yes, the autonomy of the so-called blacks and colors was being violated, no doubt. But what I saw in front of my eyes was that these people were being demeaned, treated as having very little worth. You can shuffle them around like animals. For me, my gut told me it was the demeaning of them. That was the basic thing. Yes, <laughs> they weren't allowed to live their lives as they thought fit to live their lives. I, I know that, okay, yeah. But there was this deeper thing. So you can put it like this. I've come to think that rights are what respect for worth requires. If torturing a human being is incompatible with treating that human being as befits that human being's worth, then that human being has a right not to be tortured. You wrong them if you torture them. That, I think, is what rights are. So rights represent, yeah, um, Randy? Within the social contract, and this is where people like Mill get mentioned in the conversation and you get this taste of utilitarianism around a deontological idea like this, and that is, what about when you're human with an entire community, like, is it proper to be coercive and get information if it will save 150,000 lives yep. over here? Yep. Yep. So, um, so then we get into the issues. Um, does the good, I mean, if it's really true that torturing this people will, uh, that torturing this person will save 100 lives, then the question is, is it right to torture them? I, I, let me avoid that detail. I mean, that's a really, that's the important question. But this much, it seems to me, is absolutely clear. Torturing somebody for the pleasure of torturing is patently wrong. No argument about that. Torturing somebody as a means of punishment is patently wrong. No argument. And we can argue, and it's, and it's important to argue the other case. Um, so rights, once again, rights are what, as I see it, rights are what respect for worth requires. If insulting you is incompatible with treating you with the dignity that you have, then I wrong you by insulting you. You have a right to my not insulting you, and so forth. So rights, let me put it like this. So I've, what I've done is bring together two things. First, I said that rights are always to the good of being, to the life good of being treated a certain way, a good in your life that people treat you this way. And now I said that rights, you have a right to the good of being treated a certain way if your dignity, respecting your dignity, requires it. So in my view, rights involve an interweaving of these two ideas, the life good of being treated a certain way and your dignity how well your life is going with respect to how people treat you, and your dignity. And I think the reason utilitarians cannot give a theory of rights is that they, they don't have a theory of human dignity. They only have a theory of goods. And I think that any ethical theory that operates only with goods in our lives cannot give a theory of rights. Here, here uh, let me try to make that distinction as, as clear as possible. Down, from, down through the ages, we get this lament. 
Why do the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper? Now, do you see what's going on there? Distinguishing how well, between how well a person's life is going and the worth or the dignity of that person himself. This worthy person, the righteous person, his life is going poorly. And conversely, this wicked person, who's not very estimable or admirable or whatever, his life is going very nicely. So those operate with the distinction between how well your life is going and how worthy you yourself are. I think that distinction is crucial to an understanding of rights. Okay, now I better stop for a while. Jim. Same question. So where does uh, respect for worth anchor, especially thinking culturally? So in the United States, supposedly we're all equal constitutionally, at least after we settled the racial issue. But somewhere else, uh, men are worth more because, or elders are because. Yep. Where's the anchor? So in my next talk, on, uh, so my view is this that there's a certain respect in which we human beings are equal in worth, that even the criminal possesses that worth, and that there's some things, there are some things that one ought never to do, even to criminals. But there are other things, other ways in which we vary in worth. Here's a, here's a simple, a really simple example. I'm teaching a philosophy course and somebody does bang up work in the course, in the American system, that student has a right to an A. That student has the worth, the merit, whatever, the praiseability of having done a really good piece of work. And so the proper way of treating them is to give them an A. If, if I didn't give them an A, I wouldn't be treating him as befits his worth. I would be wronging him. So that's, that's that's obviously not an equal worth, that's a worth, that's an acquired form of worth. So my view is that, and we'll get to this next time, when you get to human rights, that there are some respects in which we human beings are absolutely equal in worth, but there are other respects in which one person has one kind of admirability, another person has another kind of admirability, and so forth, and we ought to respect it. If somebody does this bang-up job in my philosophy course, they've got a right to a bang-up uh, grade. But the it's in the admirability, it's sort of in society's appreciation, it's in the eye of the beholder. No, I don't. Is the admirability the worth whatever in the eye of the beholder? No, I don't think so, usually not. And so we have to argue, argue the cases. I don't think there's, you know, there's not some nice black book of rules that I can hand, you know, fetch out of my pocket at this point and say, Here, here's how you do it. We have to argue the cases. So, when a society says men are of more worth than women, we argue that. We say, explain that to me. I don't get it. Ex explain that to me. And we find that the arguments are, are pretty deficient. When we are confronted with a society which says children have no worth, we say, you've got to explain that to me. I don't, I don't understand that. And so we have to argue the cases. And sometimes it's hard and it takes a long time. Yeah, Jeremy? Um, I guess I'm still kind of coming back to, to Jim's question here. With, and, and, and if, if this is part of the next lecture, then forgive me, as to where we anchor how we would define dignity or worth. And I agree with you. I'm more like that second group, the inherent rights group. But I, I seem to sort of come back to wanting to bridge the two instead of viewing it as a dichotomy. So my question is, and you're probably getting here, so I, I apologize, but what is that objective grounding that determines what our dignity and our worth is? And could, could we then turn and apply that to these situations? 
that come up. So when it comes, so next time I want to talk about the objective ground. What what accounts for the worth that we all have just as human beings? That's human rights. But the worth that you have is having written a bang of paper in my philosophy department. There's not a worth that you have just by virtue of being a human being. And so what's that worth grounded in? Well, you're, you're doing a really, having done a really good job at writing philosophy papers and exams. Look, I, I think all of us, here, here's what back, what's back in my thought. All of us, I think, try to get this picture in mind. All of us recognize controversies. All of us recognize excellence in things, right? That's a really good philosophy paper. That's a really good social paper. That's a really admirable house. That's a really a morally admirable person. All of us recognize excellence in things, excellence in games, in whatever. And I think the sort of fundamental moral rule is treat things in accord with their worth with their excellence. We recognize, in the North, we recognize the splendor of the um, Northern Lights. A really gorgeous display of Northern Lights. <laughs> um, but I do want, next time I want to answer the, the, the human rights, the rights that we all have just qua human beings trying to connect the northern lights and the crossing the street and some of these with what my perception and I'm not getting like my perception of rights would be I see someone on the street who's homeless who maybe doesn't have a shirt or food I, I think okay what about you know right to housing or right to food or some of these and, and maybe these are the human rights as opposed to the moral rights. I'm just having the trouble placing that. Yeah. So I'll talk about that. Yeah. But, but look, here's, here for me is the background picture. I, I've just hinted at it now. The opening passages of Genesis, God creates and says, this is really good. Now I think that's fundamental for a Christian. Reality is filled with goodness, excellence, admirability. It's also full of flaws and so forth. And among these good things are human beings. There's the Northern Lights, but human beings. And we've been talking about human beings and treating them as befits their worth. And they've got this all kinds of variable worth, but also this fundamental equal shared worth, which, um, Next time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have a yeah. clarification on that then. So is admirability then based on action? On what? Action. No, I think the admirability is... God, God beholds what God created. Okay. Right. I'm talking about people. Right? Oh, people. If we're looking at that... But in general, some of, the, some of the work that human beings have depends on what they've done. Right. There's also a, a fundamental, a more fundamental ground that does not depend on what they've done. That's why I'm trying to get to, at that term, admirability, when you're describing that person that writes the bang up paper. I want admirability to be totally true. You want it to be an inclusive term. Aurora Borealis, human beings, All criminals, right. uh, people write bang up philosophy papers. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, I don't know. Whatever. Poems, symphonies. So a really a, good symphony, one says. So the aesthetic quality is, is, inherent, is part of that. Well, so this, this really good thing about my student of having done such a splendid job in the course, I don't know if that's aesthetic. But the Aurora Borealis. The Aurora Borealis is. So some, some of this goodness, excellence, whatever, is aesthetic. Some, some is more. And some is even deeper than that. So do I save the uh, runway model, uh, or do I save the, the person without one one foot? Isn't that the goal? Yeah, the scenario. Uh, so there's some distinction there in ethical sense that it may be getting more toward uh, out of the primary, but it's the idea that you have these basic inalienable um, 
human rights that are intrinsic or inherent to every single person. But then based on the agency of the person and what they create, there is a capacity for merit within that within that all are created equal with a baseline. There's a capacity for merit and based on this person did a bang of paper. But let's say a person has a language barrier, a difficulty achieving in your class, uh, or they, they need more time. You say, well, get someone that's more adept in English or language skills to help you audit your papers and edit them and assemble them. So then I, then I differentiate. I say your effort was truly admirable, yes. but the paper was not. Right. But I mean, that, let's say that person does get well, they can they can achieve so much more than that. That's what I was trying to draw the distinction because they're trying to make it. I, I don't think you can ever create a society where everybody is just on a baseline and there's no understanding of merit based on what someone's utility to society. But even that. I think even that very basic idea of what we value, an ethical idea, is unjust. And it's not even our choosing it. Like, and I was just saying this, that I don't think it's fair. I mean, everybody would agree that a good judge is a judge that does his job well, correctly, fairly, right? So we would value that, right? Well, I don't think it's fair that the Supreme Court Justice gets 200000 a year and Judge Judy gets $30 million. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, so it's you know, totally, I mean, totally. That's about the values in society, right? Yeah. And the libertarians would argue with the real Chamberlain example that you know, a basketball player would pay as much as you just, and that's totally fair. And it seems to me like it's grounded in the same idea of rights that we're talking. About. So clearly, our society doesn't operate. America, my society does not operate on the principle we will reward you financially in accord with your. That's the mobility. Like we, we violate that principle so madly, so extremely. It's just not even worth it. I mean. Right, we are not starting at the assumption that a capitalist society is a just society. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. Yeah. Kurt? Well, Joe is giving an example, and I'm trying to think of another, but Joe is saying you may love a sentence, and I just may not even like classical music. So, so how. <laughs> to what extent is admirability, and even, this, even two different philosophy professors made different opinions quite greatly about how good a paper is. And then I'm thinking there are societies which admire people for, for, for being able to sort of cheat the system, we'll say. <laughs> it's in, in, let's say Southern Italy, you know, the, the mafia culture. You can get away with it without getting caught. That's admirable. It's a society value. So how do we do with all these uh, so admirability? So this goes so, back really back to James's question. I've got a sort of hard nosed view on that. One, liking is not a determinant, not, not an infallible determinant of worth. I can like certain things and I say no. Oh my god, my example of yesterday was the day before. I really like this cat. Well, I don't think it's a very good cat. It just showed up on my door, you know, Christmas Eve. You know, my heart just bled for the poor cat. So I really like it. Well, I'm not going to say it's great. Yeah. Your, I'll say your, your cat bird is so much finer than mine. So, so liking or disliking is not. He doesn't have a cat. Or the you. Yes. Or his mangy. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, um, social approval is, is a, in general, pretty unreliable, or disapproval is a pretty unreliable indicator. And so we have to argue the cases. There's no, no way around it. Now, um, so do we base what we're going to define as good is what God calls good? Good is what God approves. But how do we know that? <laughs> yeah, sorry, God of course. How do we know that? But if we want a sort of definition, to good, is what, good is what God finds out. Now, you and I have to try to figure out, with, with, all the, with whatever help we can muster, scripture, argumentation, whatever we can muster, to figure out what that is. Yeah, Samuel. Okay, my question. It's not about, I agree that in every society they have to have a conception of excellence. The standards may be different, but in everything, I think someone cannot avoid that. 
But my concern is about a situation where in a society that is structured and equal, some, the, some people use the culture industry to manipulate our consciousness so that I may end up believing something that's been excellent probably when it is not really excellent. But because some people at the top have some significant amount of resources, yep. yeah, 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 they, yeah. So how do we get around that? <laughs> no, I, I suppose in general there's some what like I may call wiggle room as to what's excellent, but the only way around it is to argue the cases and uh, to say let's talk about it. Why, why do you think that it's good? And listen, listen to the reasons if they have any good reasons, and if they turn out to be just power reasons, then you say that's not good enough. That's, not, that's no proof that it's good. Powerful people like it. Well, that, yeah, okay. What does that prove? So we have to be really informed and organized, otherwise we can't count the people that are <laughs> But look, we, right, but, but you and I have been here listening to, thinking about ASJ. And ASJ, per force, has to say, to the power, to some of the powerful in Honduras, we don't accept your standards. We think they're we think they're deeply misguided. We we don't accept them. I mean that's just what ASJ is doing, and it wins some of those battles and loses some of those battles. James? Yeah. I have one. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, what else? So um, the. The first question is, so you talked about sort of some kind of baseline, and then admirability goes goes up from there. Um, I haven't, yes, and I haven't given an account of the baseline. That's, I'm saving that. For okay. You. Say we take like uh, Hitler, Pol Pot, um, a serial rapist, and George Bush. We throw them all in there. <laughs> what a nice bunch. Don't reveal your politics. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, like, uh, does, does that lack of admirability try, uh, do, does that person drop, forget the George Bush part, but uh, does that person drop below the baseline? No. In my view, I'll argue that tomorrow. Nobody, nobody can. Every human being bears the image of God and is beloved by God. No human being can get rid of that. Can I ask the second one? Yeah. All right. Uh, that's that's going to be my answer uh, tomorrow. So the the argument. What happens in? Um, and I think this is where Sandy Petty. What happens in a society in a world perhaps so unequal that the ability to mount argument. Oh. The ability in which the good and the and the right and, and what is uh, justice and what is reason and what is evidence is all already so heavily uh, tainted by inequality. So there are some societies at some stages in their careers or lives which are so deeply disordered morally that it's that it's impossible to conduct any arguments. And so you work for the overthrow of those governments, those regimes, those societies. You work, and with substantial amount of force or forcefulness, yeah. You, you, arguing, arguing with Hitler would have been futile. Would, would, no point. Okay, so that's how I think of rights. They are always to the life good of being treated a certain way, and they're grounded in respect for the person's worth. And some of that worth is variable depending on accomplishments, so worth, estimability, praiseability, uh, admirability, whatever you want to call it. But some is just indispensable, intrinsic to being a human being. Um, that's what I'll argue tomorrow. So, yeah. Um.
Well, you were just raising, you were just raising your hand. <laughs> Uh, do we have 10 more minutes? I mentioned the hostility of a good many people to rights, and in particular to the idea of natural rights. So let me close with this question, and why this hostility? It's got a number of sources, I think. I think most people who are opposed to the idea of rights do not think of it the way I do not think of them the way I think of them. They are normative social relationships, but think of them the other way as protectors of autonomy, and they rightly have objections to that. But here are more two more detailed objections that I hear. One, over and over, it said that rights that the language of rights is for expressing. I'm going to use a phrase that floats around in the literature. The language of rights is designed for expressing possessive individualism. Individuals claiming their possessions. Possessive individualism. That the language of rights is designed for expressing the attitude of possessive individualism. Here's a passage from Stanley Hauerwas. The language of rights tends towards individualistic accounts of society and underwrites a view of human relations as exchanges and combats rather than cooperative endeavors. Contemporary political theory has tended to concentrate on the language of rights, not because we have a vision of the good community, but because we lack a vision of the good community. As a result, we have tried to underwrite the view that a good society is one where everybody is to be left alone, rather than one that tries to secure the kind of cooperation that gives one a sense of contributing to a worthy human enterprise. So Howard Wass is expressing, you know, that it's, it's a language designed for expressing individualism, non-cooperative, and so forth. Um, and often that charge that that's what rights language is for, is supported by a story concerning, a narrative concerning the origin of the idea of rights or of natural rights or human rights. And my guess is that at least half of you have heard this story, picked it up, maybe without even knowing you picked it up. Here's the story. The idea of rights originated in the secular enlightenment with the secular political philosophers of the Enlightenment. Standard story. That they employed this, devised and employed this idea of rights as part and parcel of their individualistic, sort of an antagonistic political philosophy. And that consequently, possessive individualism is just part of the DNA of rights talk. Any of you have heard that story of rights as going back to the secular enlightenment? No? Hmm, okay. You have. Common story. Christ a lot of Christians tell it, a lot of non-Christians tell it. Mo most, most people who have a story tell it. An alternative story, uh, which is favored by Joan Lockwood and her husband Oliver O'Donovan, is that, well, yeah, the secular philosophers of the Enlightenment, Locke and Hobbes especially, used the idea of natural rights, but they picked it up from a really bad philosopher, William of Ockham, O-C-K-H-A-M, William of Ockham, who came two centuries after Aquinas. Ockham was a nominalist, somebody who believes that there are only no universals, only individuals. And I'm not going to tell you how this all went, but the story is that Occam got Occam was a Franciscan, defending his fellow Franciscans and the right of poverty and so forth against attacks from the papacy, from the Pope. 
and that Occam employed the idea of rights to defend his, himself and his fellow Franciscans against these attacks by the Pope. I'm not going to tell you, try to tell you how all that <laughs> went and so forth, but, but Occam did employ the idea of natural rights, and he did get into a hassle with, the Franciscans did get a, into a hassle with the papacy, and Occam did defend his fellow Franciscans, so all that is true. So two stories. It begins with Locke and Hobbes, secular political philosopher, or begins with this really bad philosopher, William of Ockham. We now know that that story is decisively false. Both stories are false. Usually things in intellectual history don't get decisively disproved, but this one really does. In the 1990s, a legal historian, Brian Tierney, T-I-E-R-N-E-Y, Tierney, wrote a book called The Idea of Natural Rights. Brian Tierney, The Idea of Natural Rights. And Tierney shows beyond a doubt that the church, that the church lawyers of the 1100s were using the idea of rights. This is 200 years before Occam. They were talking about the rights of the poor, the rights of aliens, rights of bishops, rights all over the place. A tyranny is no longer alive. Second, a legal historian at Emory University, John Witte, W-I-T-T-E, one of my former students at Kelvin, has a book that's called The Reformation of Rights. The Reformation of Rights. And he argues with scads of documentary evidence that the Calvinist theologians and political thinkers of the second and third generation were using the idea of rights all over the place. So it's just false that the political philosophers of the Enlightenment invented the idea. I think that what you and I have to say is this, the idea of rights comes out of the seedbed of Christianity. It comes out of the church lawyers, the canon lawyers, it comes out of the early Calvinist theologians. Hobbes and Locke took it over. They didn't invent it. And here's a question whose answer I don't, I have no idea what the answer to it is. Why are, why are Christians of the late 20th and the early 20th, 21st century so ignorant of this part of their history? What happened to make culture amnesia set in? I'll speak from my own tradition. What happened to the Calvinist tradition so that we could totally forgot that our predecessors used the language of rights and that we bought into this alternative story that Hobbes and Locke invented it or something? I have no idea how that cultural amnesia set in. I, I simply don't know. Uh, yeah, Kurt? Go right back to your story of charity. Sorry? Doesn't it just go right back to the reason of why the church has been much more comfortable with charity and with justice? I mean, and forgetting about rights, if people have rights, then that requires something. If we can forget about that if we go yep. back to benevolence and charity. Right, that's probably part of it, but then we're still left with the question, why, does your, why did the early generations of your, your and my Calvinist heritage not have that attitude, and sometime later it acquired that attitude? Um, because they were briefly delinked from the power of the empire. The power of what? They were briefly de delinked from the power of empire. They were refugees at the beginning, and then they became powerful. Yeah, that could be. I, I mean, the, they, they were refugees, of course. But John Milton is using the language of rights, and uh, Milton was part of the English establishment. I mean, he's, he, 
constantly bucking the English establishment, but he's still part of the English establishment. So, so yeah, when you're in power, uh, you'd prefer to muffle the language of rights. It's yeah. So, so maybe that's maybe that's the answer. All I know is that whatever be the reasons, a cultural amnesia set in, and uh, people like Howard Wasson, packs of people, packs of Christians, buy the story, and then they're against they're against rights because you know it was devised by this secular secular individualistic possessive enlightenment, um, and it was not. It's not. First becomes explicit with the church lawyers of the 1100s. And then again by the Calvin, early Calvinist theologians of the um, late 15 and 1600s. Okay, that's more than plenty on my part, I would think, for one day. Questions? Uh, Com the Tyranny guy again? How did you spell that? What? T the guy called the Brian Brian Tyranny? Tyranny. T I E R N E Y. Brian Tyranny. Yes, um, uh, student Charles Reed, and I don't have the title of Reed's book. Reed has a book in which he gives even more detailed citations from the 1100s of the appeal to rights. It's a book published by Erdens. I ch Reed, R-E-I-D, Charles Reed. So Tierney and Reed together. The, the story, the common story is just false. It's just not true. Oh, and I should add one more thing. And I don't imagine, you know, so the story was used to undergird historically the charge that uh, possessive individualism is built into the DNA of rights talk. Hey, look, I don't think anybody's going to accuse the church lawyers of the 1100s and the Calvinist theologians of the 1500s of being possessive individualists. Whatever you want to accuse them of, that they were not. So, did Locke, being a confessing Christian and all, did you take that that primal the etymology of human rights back? Did, 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 did Locke or Thomas or any of those people distort what that was, or did they just displace the notion in terms of, of where it started? But they they had a similar view of human rights. Yeah. So did Locke and Hobbes distort it? Uh, they received it from their from their forebears. That's the point I've been making. They did not invent it. Here's what Witte says in his book, and it looks to me as if it's true. Witte says that every right that was recognized later on by Locke and the, U and the writers of the U.S. Declaration and Constitution was already recognized by those early Calvinist theologians and political philosophers. Without, he says they were all recognized. There's a strong chain of coherence. Yeah. So, did they use it in the same way? Because sometimes there are ideas that originate in the Christian tradition, but then they are secularized uh, later, like Hegel and his philosophy. You go yeah. ideas from philosophy. But they... So, yeah, yeah. So it's possible to say that, okay, so they received it, but they secularized it. So the rest of my argument, I'm not going to get into it. I don't think that Locke, John Locke was a secular philosopher. Locke was a Christian philosopher of a liberal sort. I think Locke should be seen as the founder of liberal Christianity of the modern world. But Locke was an eminently Christian philosopher. He, he was, well, this is a feature of Locke that I, of Locke's influence I've never understood. Locke is, Locke both founded, founded certain strands of American evangelical Christianity and certain strands of liberalism in this way. Late in his life, Locke wrote, writes commentaries on New Testament books, including Romans and the Gospels. Locke says in writing these commentaries, he's going to forget about the church councils and skip right over the councils and go straight back to the New Testament. Now this is absolutely fascinating. This is the attitude of the disciples of Christ and it's the attitude of liberal Christians. Locke is the founder of both. No creed but Christ, you know, the assemblies. You, you skip straight over the councils. Locke is the great forebearer. Pepperdine, Pepperdine University in the U.S. is Church of Christ. 
I shall never forget talking at Pepperdine about Locke, and their eyes are getting round. So, <laughs> so why are your eyes getting round? And their answer was basically, that's us you're talking about. And I think the influence was Locke, Alexander Campbell, and then the Church of Christ. Anyway, Locke was whatever whatever sort of Christian Locke was. He he was certainly a Christian philosopher. I find this comment interesting because for those of us who come from the global south, for somebody like Locke, if I'm not mistaken, he had some slave law. He was willing to recognize that his vision, right? So it's really scary that you write commentary on the New Testament. <laughs> and that's liberal Christianity. It's not even the type of Christianity. Because I was very surprised that when I read about the social gospel that. <laughs> They were supposed to be the, like the progressive, but they could not progressive very, very much in the, in the language that they used in the book I read called Race, the, the, the History of an Idea. So uh, it's interesting when I hear this about law, I feel like, oh, sometimes even when you read commentaries, you have to be very careful. Yeah. Um, you're still awake? Oh, yeah. Kurt? Uh, maybe, maybe this is a silly question. Why are we saying that rights start in 11? How does, it, does this not go back to like the Ten Commandments? And so you shall not kill people, so then I have a right to life, or uh, you, know, you shall not steal, so I have a right to my stuff. You know, is it really, does it start then? Like what, if, what does philosophers think about whatever happened before 11? I was absolutely correct. Here's Jerry's claim that these canon lawyers of the 1100s were the first to explicitly conceptualize it of the, the concept of rights. You, you, so you like coining the term? Yes. 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 And you don't, you don't, there's a few disputed cases in the Old Testament, but by and large you don't actually find the term rights in the Old Testament. So Jerry's claim is, so, so what should be, uh, so put it like this, Kurt, once, once you've heard Terry's claim that the concept and the term was first, first came to systematic use, there are a few uses before, systematic use in the 1100s by these church lawyers, then the natural question is your question, well, maybe be that it was implicit, the idea was implicit, even though they didn't have a term, ideas can be implicit in my just in Christianity, right? Yes, in my view, is that it is implicit in Scripture. But, but not just in Christianity. There are other traditions that also saw, you can't just kill people, so that I have a right to do not kill people. I think that the pagan Greek and Roman tradition recognized social rights, but not natural rights. Did not recognize that every human being, for example, so they're willing, they remain willing to expose children on mountainsides and so forth, infanticide. And there's no dispute about that. There's, there's so much to ask. What about when the God tells the Israelites to go and massacre this whole town? Being killed all the babies too. Like, is that like a pre- <laughs> so after I'd written about rights and track the, not the term, but the basic, basic, basic assumptions back to the Old Testament, there was a conference at Notre Dame about four years ago on the God of the Old Testament. And I thought, well, I better take the bull by the horns finally and look at the book of Joshua. So if you read the book of Joshua straight through four or five, six times and ignore the verses, you're going to find this phrase occurring about 11 times. And they slew all the inhabitants with the edge of the sword. They slew all the inhabitants with the edge of the sword of various cities, villages. Then you discover that in the book, late, late in the book of Joshua and his, in his companion book, book of Judges, <coughs> 
Some of the villages, all of whose inhabitants were slain with the edge of the sword, still have inhabitants. So you ask, what's going on? I think the book of Joshua is metaphorical hyperbolic literature. I ask a high school kid, how'd your basketball team do last night? He says, we wiped them out. We killed them, slaughtered them. Now you don't, you don't infer from that, my gosh, did, you, did anybody call the cops? You just take this as a hyperbolic way. I mean, it's, it's characteristic language of conflict situations. So I think from the book of Joshua, we don't know what, it's, it's a celebration of the military feats of Joshua. And it uses this formulaic phrase, they slew all the inhabitants with the edge of the sword. Actually, it turns out to be a formulaic phrase in lots of ancient literature. So it's, yeah. The way you describe it sounds a lot more innocent than my own interpretation. To me, it's, it's power relations. You are, or Joshua in this case, was the prince of the nation. He needed to justify his military decisions. Where else can I go? I'll use God. God told me to do this, and it serves us well, so nobody questions, and it's registered that way in the Bible. Rather than just, oh, we're yeah. so happy, we're in conflict, and therefore we just exaggerate with happiness. So I think that's right, but, but I want to argue that internal indications show there always was an understood metaphor, it never was understood. I mean, look, if in the same book, slew all the inhabitants of the edge of the sword of a certain village, and then laid the same book, and early in this companion book, that village still has inhabitants? He said, well, maybe these, were really, them all. these were really extremely stupid editors who put these books together. Or maybe this combat talk. We slaughtered them. Wiped the floor with them. It's, 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 it's when you go to the central books of the kings, you have the Hebrew term flow of talk which is total annihilation of people and all living things. And Saul violates Bohami, and therefore is uh, discharged by God in his kingly duties. So that, that's the only thing that's a little problematic with that. Yeah. 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 My main point here is that it's not read the Old Testament with flat syllables. Yes, yes. As if, as, if they were not, as if the Old Testament writers were not capable of metaphors and hyperbole and so forth, that only, that only we modern people <laughs> can use hyperbole and metaphor. I, I just find this interpretation of Joshua interesting because I teach religion in society and I use this document where John Hagee, John Hagee has this Kufa, Christians united for Israel, and it seems like the language he's using in this campaign for uh, Israel is just like interpreting Joshua the other way <laughs> around, like this land has been given to Israel and God gave it to them. Now, as to whether it was right or not, that's not something to be reflected on. They have the yeah. right to that, yeah. something like that. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs>